Hello and welcome. My name is Jack Ingalls and I am the Chief Executive Officer of AIMA, the Alternative Investment Management Association, which is the global representative for fund managers active in the alternative investment industry. And I'm delighted to introduce Holding Strong, Alternative Investments in a Volatile Market, which is a new program to help raise awareness of the alternative investment funds industry, which includes hedge funds and private equity and private credit funds. Now, the alternative investment industry has doubled in size over the past 10 years, with funds under management now standing at $15 trillion globally. And this represents 15% of the entire 100 trillion asset management industry. And most projections suggest that share is set to grow. Now, hedge funds are the face of alternatives in public markets, and they have long proven their ability to manage risk and volatility while still producing the expected returns for investors. They may not have always outperformed equity benchmarks over some periods, but nor are they designed to. Their goal is to deliver the best performance per unit of risk invested, and in that they have succeeded. In private market funds, whether private credit or private equity, the broad benefits have become increasingly clear across the world. Business borrowers are now able to access much needed alternative to the traditional bank lending that they had previously been heavily reliant on. Private equity funds provide growth capital to private companies that are seeking to expand and therefore create new and vital jobs. And all the while, investors in these funds are getting differentiated return streams, which are becoming increasingly attractive after more than a decade of bull markets in public bonds and equities, and which now appears increasingly at risk of reversal. This program will demonstrate how the alternative investment industry is growing in influence and will highlight its value to investors, to markets, and to the broader global economy. Among the many features that this program highlights are the latest innovations and technologies that are driving the alternative investment industry forward and exploring how ESG and sustainability are key themes for the future while addressing how the industry is fostering diversity and inclusion to attract the next generation of talent. AIMA is delighted to partner with ITN Productions to deliver this program, and many thanks to all the contributors who have participated. We hope that you will find it useful, and thank you for watching. Hello, and welcome to a special showcase edition of Holding Strong, Alternative Investments in a Volatile Market, a program from the Alternative Investment Management Association and ITN Productions. The world of investments is a colourful place. Investors look for an array of choices to preserve their wealth and to manage risk. And hedge funds play an important role with a global value of assets worth $4 trillion. Hedge funds display less volatility than investments in public equity markets. And actually, if you look at periods of, of, of market downturns, hedge funds show a lot more resilience. And then for private asset firms, private equity, private credit, what they're doing is providing much needed growth capital, which is often unavailable elsewhere, to help companies grow, help com companies become much more successful. But the COVID pandemic has not been without its challenges, and the resilience of alternative investments has been key to weathering the storm. I recognize the, the COVID environment has been incredibly hard for a lot of people and it was a very volatile time in markets, if you remember, because markets were freaked out by what was going on and you know, we were able to operate totally seamlessly. When you look back, you know, in 10 years time, you look back in history, you won't be able to see what was the COVID year in our business results and the growth of the firm and so on. It just looks like a perfectly normal year. 
And the investment company behind this residential apartment development in Leeds in the UK is committed to being environmentally responsible by making all its properties carbon neutral. We really, really focus on improving the energy efficiency of the building, um, look at putting on-site uh, energy generation such as solar panels. Not only does that mean that it reduces operational costs for us, but it cuts energy costs for our tenants. Um, and also things like electric vehicle charging points, helping the transition to low carbon travel. This is not my money. I'm a trustee or a fiduciary. And my investors are members of society. My investors want to ensure that the way we invest is environmentally um, relevant, uh, uh, does the right thing for society, but at the same time makes a long-term return. Environmental, social and governance principles are becoming increasingly important for businesses across all sectors. And this auditing tool is helping to drive sustainable change by giving firms a clearer picture of their ESG impacts. So it gathers a hundred different data points and we, and we weight it based on the global standards of ESG measurement so that it's not wishy-washy, it's not all qualitative, it's actually measurable so you can score it and benchmark it and that's what people have really struggled to do before. This provides us with that uh, qualitative and quantitative measurement for, um, for ESG within any given asset. We've gone from a, a spreadsheet to a full-blown life cycle ESG auditing tool that helps us on the way into the business. It provides us with the sort of annual monitoring, but also important agenda setting uh, information. Another specialist asset management firm is focused on how ESG principles can be incorporated while investing in emerging markets. I think it would be a mistake if ESG investing simply meant investing in the best current performers. What we really need to do is to invest in the worst performers that are showing a willingness to improve. That's really how we make a difference. And here, working groups support investors across the world to better understand and incorporate ESG principles. This is no longer a niche strategy. Um, this, is, this is a mainstream part of the asset management world and we really want to be kind of thought leaders in it, especially in our strategy, in our kind of niche space. And that push for greater transparency in the alternative investment sector is being driven by technology. The self-service technology that we've built to ensure you can get your data in your hands when you want it and how you want it, you know, has been the key. In the olden days, you would send big extracts to clients every day. Here's your positions. Here's everything that went on with your fund. Um, you know, and then they would have to dissect it. Now, you have to give them these tools where they can pull the data when they want it, how they want it. And in our current environment, in the alternative investment industry, growth is not optional. It's essential. And businesses that are transparent about their progress now tend to be the ones that grow, uh, grow the most effectively and the most efficiently. Developing and launching a fund also requires market-leading legal advisors to support firms on how best to structure and implement financing, especially during times when the market is volatile. What Funds Finance has been able to do is to provide liquidity to businesses that are very viable, that are you know, fundamentally very strong, but have been put on hold because of the pandemic. And if you can get them through this tough period and get them out to the other side, then they can flourish. It's a team that is broken down and does a whole range of activities for funds from information, financing, transactional, and disputes. So um, trying to capture the whole life cycle and the whole spectrum of economic activity that the funds perform. With increased environmental volatility, insurance-linked securities allow insurance companies to transfer risks to the capital markets. Typically, the type of risk that you assume is exposure to, for example, a natural catastrophe, okay? Now, this is a kind of a, a low frequency but fairly high severity type event. But when it doesn't happen, you'll still collect your premiums, okay? So over time, the premiums that you collect should outweigh the losses that you pay. And catastrophe modeling can also help predict the potential impact of climate change. To ensure that we are pricing all of our investments accurately, 
you do need to have that sort of in-house expertise in not only how these models will be built, but also their limitations. There is nothing more exciting than coming into work in the morning knowing that you have to help people understand the impact of a natural catastrophe which is occurring and can be unfolding as the day goes on. When it comes to improving gender balance within the workplace, one firm is not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. With 46% of its workforce and 29% of its partners being female. And a mentoring scheme has helped make it happen. It felt great. I felt like I'd really not just become a partner, but actually broken through some sort of barrier as well. Um, and hopefully opened you know, the floodgates for other people to come through, other women, um, to see that actually it's possible to be you know, made a partner in this type of firm. So it was great. You feel like you have a support network and also feel that you are enabling the next generation of talent to be able to progress and hopefully follow in your footsteps and, and hopefully do even greater things. So it's made me feel like it's possible to absolutely strive to the top and, and to be a leading female in the industry as well. Thank you for watching Holding Strong Alternative Investments in a Volatile Market. All our interviews and reports are available on the AIMA website. From me and the team here, thank you for watching. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to Holding Strong, Alternative Investments in a Volatile Market, a programme from ITM Productions and the Alternative Investment Management Association. Over the decades, hedge funds have had to prove their mettle time and again to prove their value during periods of uncertainty, including most recently the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. This program will examine the latest trends of a sector that's innovating to support the real economy through volatility and meet the needs of modern investors. The alternative investments universe is broad and densely populated with investment funds pursuing a wide variety of strategies across public and private markets. Among the more popular alternative investments are hedge funds. But what are they and why should we care? To discuss this further, we've created a short animation. The world of investments is a colourful place. Investors look for an array of choices to look after their investments and minimise the possibility of it falling in value. Hedge funds play an increasingly important role, with the global assets doubling in size over the past decade to now be worth over $4 trillion in counting. Eight out of ten institutional investors, such as pension funds, universities, charities and insurance companies, are entrusting their money into hedge funds. The largest investor type, and still growing, is pensions, with one in two investing. So what exactly is a hedge fund? The stock market can bounce around, going up or down or nowhere, leaving investments like stocks and bonds exposed to market volatility. Hedge funds smooth it out, employing highly sophisticated risk management tools and strategies. So when some securities go down in value, the loss incurred to the investor may be offset by hedge positions and other securities going up in value. Over a 20-year period, hedge funds have come with a lower risk than investing in the stock market. The risk is half. During turbulent times, hedge funds have been best at protecting investors' money. While stock markets have fallen sharply, hedge funds have fallen far less and recovered so much quicker. COVID-19 saw leading stock markets plummet by as much as a quarter in value. Hedge funds on average lost just 11% and recovered these losses quicker than a stock market investor, ending 2020 up 19%. Using knowledge, data, agility and entrepreneurial spirit in both public and privately traded companies, hedge funds make informed decisions to react quickly to changes in market prices, keeping across changing global issues and innovations that impact the markets. Hedge fund and private credit managers are increasingly important finance partners to businesses across the economy. The capital they provide helps these businesses invest in their future, create jobs and compete in the global marketplace. 
Across the world every day, investors are buying and selling and hedge funds are leading the way in this colourful display, benefiting their investors, markets and the global economy. I'm joined by Jack Ingalls, the Chief Executive Officer of AIMA. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for being with us and for talking to me. Um, let's start with what AIMA is and, and what your role is in the alternative investment industry. Yes, so AIMA is a, a membership organisation and, and we were set up to pursue activities for the mutual and collective benefit uh, of the alternative uh, investment funds industry. We have 2,000 members, over 60 countries, um, so members of all around the world and, and actually offices uh, all around uh, the world. And our principal goal is one of advocacy, communication and education. And, and we pursue that through uh, a dedicated program of engagement, of events, of publication uh, and guidance uh, for our members. Because running an uh, alternative investment firm it's really quite a complex business, but especially around the areas of, of regulation. And we're here to help um, really through providing learning, through our specialist input, and also so that our members can learn from each other. Now, the, the title of our programme is Holding Strong. Uh, do you think that's a fair assessment of how alternatives are faring right now? I think it is, yes. I mean, performance um, from alternative investment funds is very good. They're meeting their investor requirements for returns. And investors are committing even more capital to alternative investment funds. Uh, and particularly at the moment, after more than a decade of bull markets in public equities and public bonds, I think what investors are, are noting is that they're actually more vulnerable uh, and at risk of reversal. So they're choosing alternatives um, to diversify away from that risk and to seek out uh, investments that are less correlated to potentially the ills that might beset traditional investment styles in public equity and bond markets. Mm. And why is this sort of programme important? Why should people be watching uh, a programme on alternative investments? Well, I mean, despite being around for a very long time, alternative investments, that is, I think they're still largely um, not very well understood. So what I'm hoping with this programme is that we can provide a lot more clarity on what alternative investments are and why they should form a very core part of modern uh, investment portfolios, not as a, um, uh, a, 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 as a competitor for it, but as a complement to traditional investing wisdom. Well, let's dive into some of the alternative investments. So talking about private equity, talking about hedge funds. Uh, public perception on, on those uh, two areas can be quite mixed. Do you think they deserve the reputation they have? Yeah, I mean, yes, it is. It is quite mixed. And I, I do acknowledge that. Um, but I really do feel that's down to a lack of complete understanding of what they're all about. Um, I mean, some people think that, um, that, that, that alternative investments are not regulated um, but they are, just like every other um, asset management firm uh, in the world. Some people think of them as more risky, but they're not. Hedge funds, for example, uh, display less volatility than investments in public equity markets. And actually, if you look at periods of, of, of market downturns, hedge funds show a lot more resilience to those downturns than, than traditional equity funds, let's say. Uh, and then for private asset firms, private equity, private credit, um, some people do have suspicions about the changes they might bring to bear on their portfolio companies. But in fact, what they're doing is providing much needed growth capital, which is often unavailable elsewhere, to help companies grow, help com companies become much more successful. And I, and I see one of the roles of AIMA is to help uh, people understand these investments a lot more and get this out to a wider audience. Now, Jack, we're going to be coming back to you uh, towards the end of the programme. But for now, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us. Thank you. Man Group has weathered the storm of the pandemic with results that CEO Luke Ellis said demonstrated the group's growth and resilience during what he described as a challenging environment in 2020. We went to meet Luke Ellis and others to find out more about where this resilience comes from and how this resilience has manifested itself across the industry. 
Empty desks are springing back to life at Man Group's London offices. But when the global pandemic made home working the norm, its investment in cutting-edge technology made sure it was business as usual. Part of the point of the, the quality of the infrastructure here is it's flexible. It can cope with much faster markets, much higher volumes. We weren't necessarily expecting to need to move everyone to working from home, but the technology allowed us to cope with lots of different sorts of environments. And it's a testament to the quality of the technology teams how easy that was. COVID-19 has put every organisation's resilience plan under the spotlight. But Man Group's focus on technology did more than ensure continuity. It gave the second largest hedge fund in the world the speed and agility to deal with volatility across global markets. I recognise that the COVID environment has been incredibly hard for a lot of people and it was a very volatile time in markets, if you remember, because markets were freaked out by what was going on and you know, we were able to operate totally seamlessly. When you look back, you know, in 10 years' time, you look back in history, you won't be able to see what was the COVID year in our business results and the growth of the firm and so on. It just looks like a perfectly normal year. The thought process is all around how do we protect capital. The technology lets us be effective and efficient. And the point about all of that is it lets us get out of the way of trouble. You know, cash is fine in that environment. And then you get reinvested when there's opportunity. And you can only do that with technology because it there's speed, but it's just volume of things. It's the, you know, in that period, March, April last year, I mean, we were doing millions of trades. And so you need technology to be able to do that. Technology, though, is in, you know, it, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's our people who are doing the research, doing the coding, building the, um, the kit, or, you know, the discretionary managers who are helped by the technology, but it's still, you know, their investment process ultimately taking the decisions. So it, it's the mix of the two. But we are at the very forefront within our industry of applying technology to those asset management issues to help the clients get better returns. And that's really the raison d'etre of the business is to help those clients add alpha, add extra sources of returns into their portfolio. And the trend that's been a background trend for a while of increasing allocations into alternatives because most clients have got as much equity exposure as they can stomach. Robin Grew is Man Group's chief operating officer. She says attracting and retaining the right talent is a critical part of its success story. Having the best talent, having motivated talent, having talent that is engaged, having talent that is able to be creative and entrepreneurial means that we can do what we're really here to do, which is service our clients. And our clients' needs are at the heart of everything we do. So the people piece, um, should never be forgotten. It's certainly not forgotten by us. And that focus on tech and talent is being reflected in new ways of working, drawing on changes made during the pandemic to boost productivity coming out of it. Frankly, some are more productive working from home. So the model is going to be different in future. It's going to be matched on what works best for each part of the firm, each individual, where they're most productive. We have proven to be an extraordinarily resilient organisation, and that is founded not overnight. That's founded in the commitment and the investment we make in tech, in our people, in our infrastructure. We've been around a very long time and without resilience and without the ability to adapt and to be credible and relevant, you don't succeed in business. And I think that resilience is being brought to bear through this extraordinary time. But it's the resilience that we tap into when we're looking for that diverse equity and inclusive workforce. It's that resilience that we have to keep going and to make ourselves better every single day. There is a thing about understanding what you are good at and focusing on that. So we don't try and do everything. What we try to do is to use technology and smart people to generate alpha, but everything we do uses technology to make us better and smarter, quicker, brighter, whatever you can do with technology. It is remarkable what it will do in the modern world and we try to embrace it everywhere. Investing in real assets has the potential to deliver enhanced portfolio diversification and strong returns for investors. 
Global Asset Manager Aberdeen is committed to investing responsibly to deliver positive outcomes that benefit its clients, society and the wider world. Just a short walk from Leeds City Centre, I've come to Clarendon Quarter. It has 324 apartments, a mixture of studios, mezzanines, one, two and three bedroom apartments. This former school building is at the heart of a recent development combining luxury living with affordable rents. There's an on-site gym, social spaces, even a laundrette. But the big difference here is 80% of the apartments are reserved for key workers, who all get a discount on the rent. We have uh, NHS workers, majority, um, and then we have like police, council workers, and then we have some that people probably won't think key workers, like retail, hospitality, um, but they all provide a public service. And even though they're paying below market rent, Clarendon Quarter is still delivering for investors. So as an institutional landlord, uh, we have a very long-term focus. So that means we've got the incentive to invest in a property to make sure it performs well from an environmental and social perspective. That means the residents are happy being here and they want to stay for the longer term. And then that means that we can give a good return to our investors and that we're um, also investing responsibly. At Aberdeen, every investment decision has to satisfy three criteria. Firstly, does it make the investment return? Secondly, does it meet our environmental credentials? And thirdly, are there any community, regulatory, legal or other aspects that would prevent us from making this investment? For me, this comes down to a really fundamental aspect of what we do. You know, you'll hear me keep talking about our investors. So again, this is not my money. I'm a trustee or a fiduciary. And my investors are members of society. My investors want to ensure that the way we invest is environmentally um, relevant, uh, uh, does the right thing for society, but at the same time makes a long-term return. And this is how you can actually very clearly match the, the link between the investment you make and the changing nature of, of real estate. We've recently invested in a, an asset in London, uh, Friars Bridge Court, uh, which is um, it is uh, going to be uh, the UK's largest uh, pathology clinic, so blood testing for the NHS. And what that will do is that will have 10 million blood tests per year and it's going to create 450 uh, jobs. But as well as global real estate, Aberdeen's diverse alternative investments embrace logistics and infrastructure around the world. And through its global portfolio, it's helping to find solutions to global problems. For example, harnessing wind power and thermal heating, as well as already being carbon neutral as a company. As well as having a net zero carbon commitment in all new builds, the real estate team is also committed to retrofitting existing properties to make them carbon neutral as well. We have a huge responsibility to reduce our environmental impact. So on developments like this one, um, we really, really focus on improving the energy efficiency of the building, um, look at putting on-site uh, energy generation such as solar panels. Not only does that mean that it reduces operational costs for us, but it cuts energy costs for our tenants. Um, and also things like electric vehicle charging points, helping the transition to low carbon travel um, and also just the wide environmental piece of having green space, trees, etc. Um, especially on development like this, we think that's really important. Whenever my friends come around, they're like, oh, is this where you live? So it's quite a nice feeling when you bring your friends over because they think like, oh, it's lovely. But everything's made easy. So like your bills, you don't have to worry about it. It's just your bundle, you pay it and then you move on. So it's adult life, but at ease. And happy tenants means happy landlords and investors. I think there can be a misconception around um, real estate that landlords are only ever interested in you know, squeezing the most income from the asset and not thinking long term. And the difference with Aberdeen and the difference with institutional investment managers is we're taking investments from, from the likes of you and I who are saving for our pensions. And yes, we're investing for income return and capital return, but we can be very thoughtful about how we do that. That thoughtfulness allows us to take views that I think can help communities and help societies. ESG factors have often been hard to quantify, yet as time passes, it's becoming a less gray area and a critical regulatory requirement. Global financial services provider Apex Group is driving sustainable change through its ESG advisory services and auditing tool. 
giving private firms a clear picture of their ESG impacts, weighted against global standards to ultimately understand the true value of their business. All of us are becoming more aware of the world around us and how economic activity can impact both people and the planet. And environmental, social and governance principles known as ESG are becoming increasingly important for businesses across all sectors. And now we're trying to really evolve it. Peter Hughes, the founder of Apex Group, is passionate about the environment. And as a global business, he wants to drive positive change in the financial services space to support greater investment in a more sustainable future. Everyone has to do something about it. It's not just about politicians and scientists trying to fix it and everyone else washing their hands of the problem. We all have a role to play. And I think particularly in the asset management space, with the deployment of capital, whether it's debt capital or equity capital, that can really make a massive difference. And Apex's ESG portal, together with its ratings and advisory services, supports clients to measure sustainability factors as well as the ethical impact of their businesses. So it gathers a hundred different data points and we, and we weight it based on the global standards of ESG measurement so that it's not wishy-washy, it's not all qualitative, it's actually measurable so you can score it and benchmark it and that's what people have really struggled to do before. I would say there is not a business in our portfolio that hasn't benefited from this process. Uh, we certainly have. Tom Falcon is a partner at Elysian Capital, an independent private equity firm that uses Apex ESG services. This provides us with that uh, qualitative and quantitative measurement for, um, for ESG within any given asset. And, and that's just been hugely powerful for us. We've gone from a, a spreadsheet to a full-blown life cycle ESG auditing tool that helps us on the way into the business. It provides us with the sort of annual monitoring, but also important agenda setting uh, information. There's not many people who are able to combine their passion and their work. Andy Pitts Tucker's banking and conservation background brought him to Apex Group. He believes ESG is no longer a nice to have, but a moral duty and increasingly a critical requirement. Regulation is beginning to change. So investment managers, if they're in the European Union, have to collect data and have to disclose environmental social governance information about uh, themselves and their underlying investments. At the same time, you have a, a fiduciary want and demand, and that is the, the people on the street who put their money into pensions, they put their money into uh, insurance, their cash flow and how that cash flow is put to work is very important. What's so important to us as a leadership team is that we walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And for Apex as a group, it's important these ESG values are also brought to life in its own business. We've partnered with Eden Reforestation Projects and what we do is we plant 10 trees for every new client contract signed and five trees for every five years of employee service. So this year to date we've planted 50,000 trees which equates to about 3,000 tonnes of CO2 reabsorbed over the next five years. We've talked there about the E, the environment and sustainability with regard to that but what about the SG, the social governance? It's about investing in people as well as the planet. Exactly, and too often people only focus on the E, the environmental piece, uh, but societal equality and sustainable future for us as a human race, for the financial services industry, we have to focus on those things too. So what that's about is bringing diversity of thought to the leadership conversation. So different genders, different ethnicities, different age groups, all contributing to that conversation so that we can be the best business that we can be. It's all about changing the conversation when it comes to ESG and by investing in people and the planet, asset managers can not only make a difference but bring integrity, relevance and longevity to how they do business. Hedge funds and finance is a world traditionally dominated by men. But Hayes McIntyre is proving that this does not have to be the reality. 46% of its workforce and 26% of its partners are female. 
But also, the firm's financial services sector is led by three women, proving that by working together, they can keep breaking through the glass ceiling. This is team building at its best. The financial world may be male dominated, but at Hayes McIntyre, it's the ladies who are taking the lead. Beginning with Bernadette, one of the firm's first female partners who also jointly heads up the financial services sector alongside Mel Pitters. Mel, also a partner, was recruited as a trainee by Bernadette and in turn, she took director Karen under her wing. This trio have built a support network encouraging junior members of the team, like Emily, to reach their full potential. Mel and Karen, you know, I've interviewed both of those women, um, you know, when they were just embarking on their career. Um, and now we're working together as a trio um, to grow our financial services sector um, and our hedge fund client base. And to, to be able to do that, you know, I've worked with them every step of the way from junior right through to their senior roles, managerial roles. Bernadette has been instrumental in establishing a mentoring system. She joined the firm as a trainee chartered accountant over 25 years ago and was made partner in 2006. It felt great. I felt like I'd really not just become a partner, but actually broken through some sort of barrier as well um, and hopefully opened you know, the floodgates for other people to come through, other women, um, to see that actually it's possible to be you know, made a partner in this type of firm. So it was great. Hayes McIntyre isn't deliberately on a drive to recruit more women, but they have managed to balance the books in terms of addressing the general gender imbalance found in most accountancy firms. 46% of staff at Hayes McIntyre are women. 29% of partners are female. Compared to the top 25 accountancy firms in the UK, this is high. Mel says the female support network within Hayes McIntyre has given reassurance to so many. You feel like you have a support network and also feel that you are enabling the next generation of talent to be able to progress and hopefully follow in your footsteps and, and hopefully do even greater things. Going back to the start of my career, it was pretty unusual to have a female chief operating officer. Um, now I have at least a handful of clients that I work with that are female, which is it's nice to see that slowly there is a shift taking place. The business say they're trying to make a difference by matching the right mentor with the right team member. More recently, we formalised the mentor scheme within the firm to try and find um, someone who is right for each of the individual members of staff and their ambitions within the firm. You know, it's not that you want to just have one mentor, you want to have a lot of mentors available to you, but there will be that one person who you can learn you know, a lot from. And this has provided encouragement to junior females joining the sector, like trainee chartered accountant and tax advisor, Emily. It's been really inspiring to have strong female leads. It's made me feel like the, the path's already paved and that it's easy for me. So it's made me feel like it's possible to absolutely strive to the top and, and to be a leading female in the industry as well. Bernadette, you must feel very proud of yourself to be the one who started this mentoring scheme and seen these women flourish. I also feel really excited for them. I don't think I'd want these people to, to be joining the sector that I joined 20 odd years ago. So I feel excited and I feel you know, passionate they'll, that they will all do well. These ladies are powerful proof that the landscape of the financial services industry is moving in a modern direction. But the change is credited to women like Bernadette, Mel and Karen. Although not setting out to, they have inadvertently spearheaded new schemes and initiatives within Hayes McIntyre, with the message for all that the sky is the limit. The COVID pandemic and an increased focus on environmental, social and governance issues has changed the fund and financial landscape. The fund's industry has reacted positively to this changing environment and is helping to maintain a stable economy. International law firm Reed Smith is partnering closely with its clients to achieve their goals and objectives.
Like these sky-high views over London, the outlook for funds focused on alternative investments continues to rise. The industry has soared in the past decade, weathering a financial crisis, Brexit and the pandemic. In particular, fund finance has seen dramatic growth. And Helios, with a range of funds totaling more than $3 billion, is one of the private equity funds embracing the benefits of fund finance. Having access to that additional capital means that if you find that one of your portfolio companies is struggling, and it's a sort of likely to be a short-term crisis, you have capital readily available. Developing and launching a fund requires experienced fund managers, close investor relationships and market-leading legal advisors. Helios works closely with market-leading international law firm Reed Smith to put in place its fund's finance transactions. Leon Stevenson co-heads a fund's finance team of more than 40 lawyers in Europe and the US, advising clients how best to structure and implement financing at the fund level. What funds finance has been able to do is to provide liquidity to businesses that are very viable, that are you know, fundamentally very strong, but have been put on hold because of the pandemic. And if you can get them through this tough period and get them out to the other side, then they can flourish. Panos Katsambas serves as the global co-lead of Reed Smith's financial industry group and says their approach helps clients across the entire life cycle of alternative investment funds. If you look at us globally, it's uh, a team that is broken down and does uh, a whole range of activities for funds from, as I said, from formation, financing, transactional and disputes. So um, trying to capture the whole life cycle and the whole spectrum of economic activity that the funds perform. More responsible investing is one significant trend to emerge in the past few years, as investors put pressure on funds to generate positive social and environmental benefits along with financial gains. Reed Smith recently worked on one of the largest ESG-focused funds finance facilities in partnership with NatWest Markets and the investment firm Carlyle. A 2.3 billion euros credit facility was formed to support Carlyle's goals on climate and board diversity. The world is changing. Um, historically, people have looked very much at the city and financial institutions as a money-generating machine. There's been a lot of focus on margin and profit but now funds are very much looking towards environmental, social and governance purposes, uh, trying to invest in a social impact way, and also to look at a longer term view of investment. There's an increasing need for all lenders, including banks, to be transparent on responsible lending. Rabobank, working closely with Reed Smith on strategic private debt fund solutions and market-leading ESG fund finance transactions, has been at the forefront of this. ESG for us uh, is very important. Uh, it's also not something that comes up overnight. We've already been 10, 15 years, we've been rating our client base on ESG metrics. Uh, so we've got lots of data, lots of experience with that. Uh, but what you really see is that the level of conversation with customers on this topic is growing. We have to look at the industry as a whole, understand the value it provides and the good that it does. And the key takeaway is you know, projecting where this industry will be in 10, 20, 30 years from now. The shift towards greater sustainability is not only good for the planet, but for the future of funds and fund finance. Environmental, social and governance, or ESG, in emerging markets is complex as each country and region is uniquely vulnerable to E, S and G factors. But Emzo Asset Management believes that there are increasing opportunities to thoughtfully incorporate ESG while investing in emerging markets. Emzo Asset Management published its first ESG policy in 2014 and shortly after became a UN PRI signatory in 2015. The firm has recently created working groups to look at how the company could operate more sustainably and incorporate ESG thoughtfully in its research analysis. What's the philosophy behind EMSO's approach to environmental, social and governance procedures? For us, 
uh, I would say, especially in the early years, the driving force was authenticity and kind of um, doing it properly, um, not trying to rush into it. Originally, we had a portfolio ESG working group, which was a collection of researchers and portfolio managers and other people at the firm as well, including me. Our second working group, which is the company ESG group, came a bit later. That group is focused on management company ESG. Environmental, social and governance factors are relatively easy to implement in a first world country, but not so straightforward in emerging markets. The availability and development of ESG data from providers such as Maplecroft and JP Morgan has allowed for more detailed analysis on a country-specific basis. I think that has been the key improvement over the last three years. Emerging market investors have generally covered governance factors quite well. It has been part of the investment process for decades. Given the enhanced data availability, we can now actually quantify both environmental and social factors, and we can include it for the first time in quantitative modeling. While EMSO has considered governance and political factors in its research process since its inception in 2000, the firm believes that the ability to consider additional ESG factors provides new perspectives for its analysis. We have an opportunity to actually see much more rapid improvement in many of these lower scoring emerging markets than some of the higher scoring emerging markets. And I think it would be a mistake if ESG investing simply meant investing in the best current performers. What we really need to do is to invest in the worst performers that are showing a willingness to improve. That's really how we make a difference. ESG has been market practice for some time in private market investing but a framework for public market sovereigns is more challenging. Private market investing is typically to corporations and that type of lending lends itself very well to an ESG framework. In emerging markets, public side, you lend to both corporations and to sovereigns. And until recently, an ESG framework for sovereign has been a somewhat difficult thing to overlay. When you look at typical ESG frameworks, you start with a rating just based on the industry or the geography that it is. However, the way that company that you're in lending to mitigates those risks is a key part of the due diligence and also part of the agreements we make with that company. It's very important for us to overlay ESG risk management frameworks that quantify and look at some of those risks but it is very exciting from the perspective of the opportunity. EMSO's asset class has not always been friendly to ESG, but the ability to better understand and consider ESG factors is improving, and the firm expects that the ability to further assess and incorporate those factors will continue to grow in the future. I wouldn't be surprised that over the next five, 10 years, there's no such thing as an explicit ESG overlay. It's just part of common sense investment. We view the opportunity set to be great, to be an opportunity rich environment to think through ESG issues. And you know we will continue to refine our process, sharpen our lens, and hopefully get better at it every day. This is no longer a niche strategy. Um, this, is, this is a mainstream part of the asset management world, and we really want to be kind of thought leaders in it, especially in our strategy, in our kind of niche space. And we're working toward that goal. The alternative investment sector has remained strong by being transparent, visible and accessible. The Sitco group of companies offer transparency using their technology, which is designed to meet the unique challenges of their clients. Life on Wall Street can seem like a blur. From the fast pace of New York City life to the tens of trillions of dollars worth of business done here at the world's largest stock exchange. The alternative investment sector, which covers everything from hedge funds to real estate, has traditionally been seen as a particularly opaque part of the financial sector. But there is an increasing push within these investments to become more transparent and accessible. 
The Citco group of companies, Citco for short, believes technology can be the driving force behind that. With over $1.5 trillion in assets under administration, Citco aims to be a one-of-a-kind operational backbone to alternative investment businesses. Our vision is simply that we want to give these alternative asset management firms a toolkit to grow. Citco carries out a wide range of support services for clients, from banking to providing its own bespoke software for risk management and reviewing their portfolios, giving investors more control and clarity. The self-service technology that we've built to ensure you can get your data in your hands when you want it and how you want it, you know, has been the key. An example of self-service is dashboards that we have on our portal, Citco One. API technology where our larger clients can come in uh, to our data lake uh, and pull their data. The reason you need the self-service is because if you want it to be accurate, if you want it to be timely, uh, in the olden days you would send big extracts to clients every day, here's your positions, here's everything that went on with your fund, um, you know, and then they would have to dissect it. Now you have to give them these tools where they can pull the data when they want it, how they want it. Founded in 1948, Citco began serving clients and multinationals in the wake of World War II and continues to be managed by the founding Smeets family. But despite its roots firmly planted in the past, its eyes are on the future as it pushes boundaries with its technology. The hope is new technology will make the financial sector more transparent and open it up to a wider group of people. And that could be crucial as Wall Street and other financial centres around the world look to recover from the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been absolutely proven that uh, diversity, inclusion, really does support growth and performance. And in our current environment in the alternative investment industry, growth is not optional, it's essential. And businesses that are transparent about their progress now tend to be the ones that grow, uh, grow the most effectively and the most efficiently. To help them grow, Citco says it's vital to adapt to the changing needs of clients in the alternative investment sector. Clients of Citco need us as a comprehensive foundation for their growth. The support that we provide can really run the gamut. It can be across a lot of different support areas. Uh, it now post-pandemic especially, has more of an operational backbone to it where more support areas are expanding to being much more of a primary day-to-day -day, real time support. Uh, and that can include everything from you know, middle office and treasury solutions, it can be capital, it can be not merely software, but uh, software and support around it, um, you know, banking, financial reporting, everything. Uh, in a really swift, accessible environment. Client needs in the alternative investment sector have changed dramatically in recent years, from simple accounting and pricing data to much more varied demands. And as the industry continues to evolve, Citco says there's no more important question for them than what's next. With increased environmental volatility across the globe and with climate change dominating headlines, there's an ever-increasing need for insurance. As this demand grows, Securus Investment Partners has become a distinctive and disruptive force in insurance-linked securities and have found themselves well-positioned to ride out recent storms. Natural disasters can be devastating. When Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992, it was one of the most destructive and costliest, causing over 15 billion in insurance losses at the time. To make matters worse, there was a shortage of insurance cover. This is when the first catastrophe bond was issued and Insurance Link Securities was born, a system that allows insurance companies to transfer risk to the capital markets. Typically, the type of risk that you assume is exposure to, for example, a natural catastrophe, okay? Now, this is a kind of a, a low frequency but fairly high severity type event whereby it doesn't happen very often. It has a low probability of happening. But when it doesn't happen, you'll still collect your premiums, okay? So over time, 
the premiums that you collect should outweigh the losses that you pay. Keeping an eye on the eye of the storm is Dr Paul Wilson. He works as a scientist at Securus, a London-based asset management company. It invests exclusively in ILS. He has a PhD in atmospheric science, has visited disaster zones and developed models to understand the risks of major catastrophes. There is nothing more exciting than coming into work in the morning knowing that you have to help people understand the impact of a natural catastrophe which is occurring and can be unfolding as the day goes on. There are catastrophe models to help assess risks, such as how buildings will hold up in a potential hurricane. But Paul and his team also analyse the potential impact of climate change. When you layer on top an environment which is changing and sort of the implications of climate change and how that is impacting on natural catastrophes, to ensure that we are pricing all of our investments accurately, you do need to have that sort of in-house expertise in not only how these models have been built, but also their limitations. Investments are mostly natural catastrophes, but also include life insurance and health-related risks. Investments are kept separate from the turmoil of capital markets. We want to give investors an exposure to pure insurance risk. So not linked to credit or capital, equity markets, but rather to the actual risk taken by an insurance company. This has allowed the ILS market to weather various financial crises. Of course, one of the biggest impacts recently was the COVID-19 pandemic, causing economic turmoil. Governments across the world stepped in to help, but it was worrying times for investors. The markets tried to correct themselves in March of 2020, when the world realized that we're actually at the beginning of a pandemic. But then a kind of a spectacular amount of monetary intervention from governments ensued and the markets recovered. But nevertheless, the markets were down 20-25% in March during a period where insurance-linked securities was largely unaffected. Securus manages around 4.5 billion of assets. So the ILS market has grown from around about $11 billion in 2005 when Securus was formed to $100 billion today. Uh, the types of opportunities within the market has grown quite considerably as well. Back in 2005, a uh, large focus on remote risk cat bonds, fairly vanilla structures, but today a much wider variety of structures, more complex, a wider, a wider range of return profiles as well. Top uh, tier consultants have been suggesting pension funds for quite a while to have at least a, between a 2 and a 5% allocation of their assets to ILS, precisely because of the decorrelating nature alongside a quite interesting and attractive return. And other insurance risks are now being considered. Beyond natural catastrophe, other insurance-related risks could include space, aviation, marine-based risks, uh, risks related to other sort of property uh, exposures like fire, terrorism, for example. Uh, and all of these risks are, are being looked at very, very closely by the ILS market. 70% of economic damage caused by natural disasters around the world go uninsured. The ILS market can help close this gap. Insurance allows people to rebuild their lives when, when bad things have happened. So that is a pretty good starting point when we start discussing ESG with investors and our stakeholders. Big natural disasters don't occur that often, but when they do, there's a huge amount to learn. I'm joined again now by Jack Ingalls, Chief Executive Officer of AMA. Uh, well, Jack, now that we've heard out the industry, what are your expectations for the future uh, for alternative investments? Well, I'm extremely positive. Um, you know, at the moment, the global funds industry is about $100 trillion, a little bit more. And um, the alternatives component of that is about 15% currently. And I think that's got scope to increase to 20% within the next decade, if not, um, if not sooner. Um, now, most in institutional investors currently own alternatives in their portfolios. So I think some of the real growth can come from private wealth and indeed even retail channels as products are made more, under, more available to them and more understandable to them. Now, one of the fastest growing sectors uh, at the moment is private credit. And I think the demand for yield 
when interest rates are so low, is going to continue to make them stand out and very popular uh, with investors. Mm. And for hedge funds, um, they really are at the, the cutting edge of the use of technology and data analytics, which I think position them extremely well as compared to traditional investing styles um, to take advantage of this sort of data rich and data heavy world uh, that we live in. So I think they are going to stand out as well um, for, use, for the use of technology. And then finally, um, I can't leave without talking about ESG, environmental, social and governments and sustainability issues. And I would say that the alternative investment world really do get that at the moment. And I think they're very well positioned um, to be at the forefront of this rapidly developing investment theme and take advantage of the new opportunities as they present themselves within that world. Jack, thank you very much. Great to get your thoughts on that. Uh, and thank you for watching Holding Strong, alternative investments in a volatile market. All our interviews and our reports are available on the AMA website. From me and the team here, thank you for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>